Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to It Takes a Child to Raise a Village, Public Outreach and Student Engagement at the Cottonwood Village Excavation in Nine Mile Canyon, Utah. I'm Elizabeth Hora, Public Archaeologist at the Utah State Historic Preservation Office, and we are hosting today's event in celebration of Nine Mile Canyon Stewardship Day and International Archaeology Day. As with all these things in these crazy COVID times, we are doing these days a little bit differently. Um, usually we all gather in the canyon with our friends at the Nine Mile Canyon Coalition and Project Discovery. This year, we're hosting new and interesting talks related to Nine Mile Canyon each Wednesday through November. This week we have Tim Riley of USU Eastern's The Historic Museum on with us. Hi, yeah, thanks Elizabeth for having this great event uh, over the last uh, week or two and up into November. Uh, it's a good way. We were disappointed to see Nine Mile Canyon Site Stewardship Day canceled, uh, although it was probably for the best. Give me one sec to get everything going. Uh, getting Still getting used to Zoom, surprisingly. Uh, and it looks like uh, Never had a waiting room before. That's an interesting idea. Uh, get to pre-screen some of the riffraff like uh, Dr. Merritt joining us right now. Anyways, I'm gonna talk briefly uh, today for about 20 minutes uh, about uh, this excavation that happened out in Nine Mile Canyon over the last four years or so that I was a, a, a small participant in. Uh, it takes a child to raise a village, public outreach and student engagement at the Cottonwood Village Excavation in Nine Mile Canyon in Utah. Of course, All right? Oh, uh, I'm not advancing, isn't working. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, so what is this project I'm talking about? Well, so it is a it is a BLM sponsored project. It started in 2016, although the first field season was actually 2017. And it's a partnership between the BLM Green River District and both of its field offices. Um, as well as Arizona State University School of Community Resources and Development, and specifically their tourism department, uh, tourism recreation department, I think is what it's called. Uh, they were actually the, um, the main player, although most of the work was done by uh, Jody Patterson and the Montgomery Archaeological Consultants, one of our fine CRM firms here in Utah. Um, and then the Colorado Plateau Archaeological Alliance, Jerry Spangler's uh, nonprofit, and my museum here, the Prehistoric Museum, part of Utah State University, Eastern down here in Price, all, uh, all contributed as well. And here we see some of our fine, oh, I need to get this out of here, right? You guys can see all yourselves on the screen, maybe. Uh, here we see some of our fine participants uh, at the Cottonwood Village site. And you can see it's a fairly typical Nine Mile Canyon um, view here. We've got the beautiful bottomlands uh, covered in alfalfa uh, at the moment, uh, but would have been covered in cornfields a thousand years or so ago. There's actually a couple of granaries right there. You might be able to see uh, across there. And this Cottonwood Village uh, is part of a much larger complex, uh, a much larger complex uh, in and around the, the where Cottonwood Canyon and Nine Mile Canyon join, it's where the Daddy can or excuse me, it's where the uh, Big Buffalo is. It's where the Great Hunt is, and this is one of the villages right around there, and would have been a majorly occupied part of uh, Nine Mile Canyon during the Fremont period, and particularly the later Fremont period. Hold on, I don't know why my slides aren't advancing, and this is actually a, a list uh, of all the goals. Uh, the 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 reasons for doing this. Uh, the first was to, and this is a great uh, drone shot by Ryan Moreau, who's a uh, one of the avocationalists involved with USAS and other organizations. He came out here fairly on, fairly early on in the first year to, to do some drone footage. Um, uh, we'll still look at some other overhead shots near the end of this. You can see the buckets and all that. But this is an, uh, the goal of this was to ex excavate this archeological site that's intrigued experts for many years. It's one of the sites identified in the West Tablet puts programmatic agreement uh, for interpretation as part of the BLM's interpretive plan. And it's had a sign saying uh, Cottonwood Village or Fremont Village pointing up the hill to it uh, for as long as I've been here, which is about eight years and, and a little bit longer than that, really with the, with the improvements in the road out there. And as I said, it's right next to some of the highlights of the rock art uh, that many people associate Nine Mile Canyon as a rock art landscape. Um, but of course, there's people lived where they made their art as well. Um, and so I've had many people come into the museum here. We're, we're 
I guess the closest museum to Nine Mile Canyon. So we get a lot of stopover from that saying, well, we went to where it said there was a Fremont village and we got up there and we couldn't see anything um, because of course these collapsed pit structures really don't look much like a house to you know the average American who's used to a, a stick built or, or other type of uh, modular home today. And so the first goal was to excavate an archeological site that has intrigued experts for many years. And then of course we can't just excavate, right? That's only a small part of archeology. span We have to analyze and interpret that data, both for the public benefit and for our own scientific advancement and understanding of past life ways, uh, as we see in the third goal. And then we want to create a unique hands-on experience for volunteers and explicitly within that volunteer group, expose archeological method and other STEM education components to high school students. And we actually expanded beyond high schools as this project went on. And then, of course, we want to introduce more people to native history and public lands and outdoor experiences and encourage people to visit and visit respectfully uh, and enjoy Nine Mile Canyon and all the surrounding areas. Nine Mile Canyon gets a lot of the, uh, the pub uh, because of its rock art. But of course, all these other areas here in eastern Utah have fabulous Fremont archaeology as well, including our talk, uh, I think, next week uh, about Range Creek. Um, uh, another really important interior canyon of the Tabafoots. And then we want to involve the community to generate hopefully some stewardship ethics and community pride and and uh, and sort of piggyback on some of the ongoing stewardship eth efforts we see out of uh, Friends of, of Cedar Mesa, as well as the new position uh, with uh, the state history for a stu uh, statewide site stewardship coordinator. I don't know why I'm, I'm, that's not working. So that was the the overall goal. And here's uh, some of the some of the metrics of, of participation. There were actually only two uh, years of field work, um, and there's some other uh, activities as well. And I'm mostly going to walk through uh, some of the experiences students had out there. And here we actually see uh, in 2017. This is a local artist here in Halber, Stephen Lee Adams, painting, uh, doing his uh, you know open air painting of one of these one of these crews. There's Jody. You can see he's got all his safety vests on and. Uh, Safety fencing up. In 2017, there were a total of 72 volunteers over six weekends, um, about 42 youth and about 30 adults. Uh, most of them came from high schools. Uh, there were four high schools that came out that first year. And there were actually, uh, including people who came out as guest speakers or some of the BLM um, archaeologists and, and other people, about 100 people or just under 100 people came out that year. Uh, this does not include visits to the site by tourists or anything like that. And we were out there for about 18 days. Really, I sh when I say we, I mean Jody and his crew, like Patricia. Uh, uh, I was out there maybe six days. Um, and in 2018, we actually had slightly less uh, participants, about 81. We were actually only out there for five weeks, and uh, one of them was cut short by a day. Uh, we had uh, 27 youth and 22 leaders, and then we had 15 sponsoring participants, people like me or Jody or uh, Christine Voigt, who's the professor down at Arizona State. Oh, I guess that's a, under the next one, and some other volunteers. And of course, we had multiple uh, tourists or other visitors to the canyon stop by, roughly somewhere between you know uh, a dozen to maybe 30 on most weekends outside of one day in particular every year that I'm going to talk about. And we were out there for 14 days. There's been some other excavation, but most of that's actually been done by Jody uh, in terms of, uh, of getting on. And what's interesting about this project, so as I say, Jody and his crew were really the supervising archeologists, but almost all of the work was done by uh, student groups and associated adult volunteers. There, were, there was one or two weekends that were a mix of community volunteers, and that was fun as well. Um, and, and this was a, the goal of this is not only to expose them to archaeology, but this idea of experiential learning. Uh, it really can help students who are struggling in the classroom recognize that they are good at things that are maybe academic in a way that they don't that they normally don't think of. And for many of them, it was their first time camping. Here we see uh, a typical weekend campsite down here, the mess hall, and various tents around there. Uh, there's an RV over here in the corner that you can't see. And for many of these kids, it was their very first time. Uh, camping or uh, doing any sort of real outdoor recreation, which of course goes hand in hand with archaeology. Here we see the students hauling their screens and other equipment up this trail to the village. The village is basically up here. Um, it's actually dispersed like most of these Fremont villages in Nine Mile Canyon. And here are some of our participants. Uh, you can see they're getting down and dirty in the dirt right there. They're getting a chance to actually hold a trowel or a brush or a measuring tape. Um, 
and, and do some of this actual hands-on archaeology. And that's really one thing that field sciences uh, and archaeology in particular can really um, help students and other community avocationalists uh, find is that joy of discovery. And you can see based on the smiles on their faces, these ladies all had a good time. This is a mother and daughter couple that were out there as well. Uh, they're excited with all the stuff they found in the screen. Um, and so this was really a, a fun experience for a lot of these people. And in many cases might be a once in a lifetime experience and something that they'll hold on to for, for years to come. It's, oh, that was so much fun. And I, you know, did science while also getting to getting to uh, explore the past right in history just some more photos of them i'm mostly going to keep this a, a sort of light and photo based talk uh, and here we see them learning how to collaborate as a team right we're taking measurements and also learning how to uh, how to map things like that and that's one thing that i think we don't see a lot in schools although you might have a lab partner in biology learning to work uh together on something that's maybe a new approach in terms of uh, in terms of mapping a, a, a unit or something like that, uh, it, it could be a new thing. And here we see a former uh, Shippo alum, uh, Dr. Sean Lambert, uh, doing what he does best, leaning on the handle of a shovel. It looks like a looks like a DOT project, but you see everybody else is hard at work here, uh, getting this site set up. And of course, these students didn't just. Uh, work. It wasn't just about the volunteer labor. They also got to explore this incredible canyon, um, which has some of the, you know, some of the densest rock art uh, in, in Utah, at least, and perhaps in North America, and really has a really, uh, really strong pull on the imagination, uh, just from driving down into that canyon to seeing some of the historic structures, some of the historic inscriptions going all the way back to some of the pictographs that you can see there uh, and, and beyond. And so here they are uh, looking at the big buffalo site with Nate Thomas, the BLM state archaeologist. And then in the evenings, they would actually have presentations and uh, they did a really good job of bringing the diversity of people, everything uh, from talking about oil and gas development on the Tavaputs to the Nine Mile Canyon Settlers Association came in. In this case, it's Jody Patterson um, talking to them. And I forget the topic of this talk, uh, but nonetheless, uh, they so they got a full exposure. They got to spend time excavating and screening and taking meticulous notes and photos some of them even got to help uh, map a little bit um, with total stations. And then they would also get to explore the canyon a little bit and then also learn about the history of the canyon from uh, local experts like Jody. Oh. Here's just another shot of our of our campsite uh, for the evening. And you can see how beautiful it is out there. Uh, and for a lot of these kids, it might have been their first time using a uh, portage on there. And then this is another painting by, this is Stephen Lee Adams in his gallery, which is in the old Sears building in Helper, downtown Helper, most intact historic district in Eastern Utah. Uh, check it out if you haven't. Uh, it's it's really quite a nice uh, collection of, of structures uh, working on this painting. And he did some other paintings as well. As you can see, this is a painting as much about the archeology span and, and the, the peopling of science as it is about the uh, site itself. And of course, we had to distribute and have some public outreach. This is part of a larger event that was originally started by uh, Project Discovery. And I think uh, Marky is going to be talking in a couple of weeks about the insights from that. It's been going, it went on for about seven years before this year. Um, and, uh, and it started with the Salt Lake Center for Science Education, which is a charter school in the Salt Lake area. And in the last two years was involved with our local Carbon High. And uh, there's me and one of our student volunteers from Slixy uh, talking to uh, Pam Miller, um, a former curator here at the museum, and, uh, and Blaine Miller is off screen, a former BLM archaeologist and husband, and really just, uh, as well as other citizens, really just talking to them about, uh, about what they're seeing here. Uh, and here we see again, some other tourists with Jody's talking to them up at the site, trying to explain what they're seeing. Because again, the goal of this, one of the goals of this is to make this site more interpretable so that as the BLM moves forward with their uh, interpretive plan for uh, Nine Mile Canyon, that this site can really talk a little bit more than just the rock art and talk about the people that live there. I'm gonna focus just briefly on one, uh, one particular school that we had a lot of fun with. Uh, this is John McHugh. He's a fifth grade teacher at the Blessed Sacrament School, which is a Catholic uh, private school up in Sandy. And he has a uh, archeology span club for his fifth, I think through eighth graders. Uh, and they, they cap out at eighth grade. Um, called the shovel bums, right? And those of us from the industry, of course, probably maybe identified as a shovel bum at one point in our lives when we were doing uh, construction work. Uh, 
uh, construction related work. And they actually came out uh, on the last week in uh, 2018 and 19. And I'm just going to go through some of his photos that he shared with me to sort of highlight the the idea that this learning experience, it was disguised so well that they thought they were just having fun when they were actually learning stuff, right? So here they are getting an introduction to the site on the first day. That's uh, Patricia Stavish, who's one of the Montgomery archaeologists. She's teaching them how to measure uh, below a line level, right? So we can get our depth below surface or depth below data. Learning how to lay out units. And again, these things are not just archeological, but they're also uh, 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 geometric and in some ways uh, trigonometry uh, that they're using to do these various uh, measurements and laying out of units. And here they are actually learning how to actually make, taking the depth at a level. And you can see that Basically, that's John McHugh in the background there, the, the teacher, and he's a former archaeologist who went back into teaching, uh, excavating in their in their level, in their units, in a, uh, in a 10 centimeter level. Um, it says units there, but it should say a level. Uh, so they really got to do all the hands on here uh, and they got to see both the sort of frustrations of archaeology uh, can be screening a lot of empty dirt sometimes, as well as some of the excitement we see here and we'll follow up here. Here's Sarah, one of his students, who found a mono, and you can just tell from her posture and her face that this was really quite thrilling, right? This was really a, a good experience for her, and probably something she'll remember for, for quite some time, uh, and perhaps build on. Of course, they screened for artifacts through quarter-inch screens, looking for various things. And what's interesting about this site is that one of the major uh, artifactual components of it are uh, slate and shale beads basically from the raw rock material through the fire treating through the bead process. You can actually find an operational chain all the way from start to finish of these beads. So here we see one of the associated, I don't think she's a fifth grader, but one of the other uh, 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 parent supervised, parent chaperones child out here with some of the raw material. Here you can see them as they're being worked through the process, right, and them breaking. And then you see there's a final uh, slate bead there. Um, and there, there's quite a few of these from the site. And another one that's a little bit rougher, right? Not quite finished, it hadn't been polished. Uh, and then the other main artifactual component they find are effectively bifaces and occasional dr drills or gravers um, that were probably used to maybe pierce the be beads or, or, or perhaps in the bead process. I'm not going to talk much about the site itself. It's actually really interesting. There's at least two different uh, remodeling events that happened uh, at the site, but, uh, but we'll save that for a different talk. And they also got to the joys of doing field work, where you get to uh, maybe rinse your hands briefly under a tap from an orange igloo cooler and then go eat on a rock somewhere. And uh, you can see there's a couple of the young ladies. Uh, sitting on top of a rock and right underneath them, a couple of the young men from that class uh, also enjoying a little bit of shade and a respite from the field work. It can be hot, dry and dusty when you're out there on a site, uh, although it's, a, it's always a lot of fun. And that was really, in many ways, the point of this was to show them that they could use the skills they learned in the classroom, like measurement, like uh, angles and uh, the Pythagorean theorem and things like that, in a real world application that's kind of exciting. And it's about the thrill of discovery and, and thinking about all the people who've lived in this landscape and called it their home over the last 13,000 years or so. Uh, and that's really one of the goals. But we didn't stop with the field. We actually had a couple of lab visits. This is again, John McHugh and his um, students from uh, Blessed Sacrament School uh, in my lab space at, on campus here at USU Eastern. Um, and you can see they're actually, this is basically all, all slate and shale that they're going through and processing. Uh, here's Jody talking to a bunch of the students from the Salt Lake Center for Science Education. Right, and here's some of our carbon high dinos, as you can see from the young lady's shirt there, as they, uh, as they work through some of this stuff. And of course, we had a couple of public uh, Nine Mile Canyon days uh, in the museum, uh, probably the most attended event in the classroom since I've been here. We had to turn people away because we were at capacity uh, for fire safety uh, for one of these, I think it was the one before this. And we brought in a bunch of the collaborators and really wanted to celebrate Nine Mile Canyon and how important it is, both as an archeological um, district, 
but also as a, a part of our landscape today, right? And something that our local community should be very proud of uh, and, and visit and, and enjoy respectfully as much as possible. Oh, did I go? Nope. So what came out of this? Well, one thing that's come out of this, this is actually a student of uh, at, at Carbon High. She's a senior this year. This is her junior, uh, junior year science fair project. Uh, and she, she got involved with this through both project discovery and also through um, through the, the Cottonwood Village excavation. And she came in and started volunteering in the museum. And last fall, she said to me, well, I wanna do a science project based in the museum. So I had a uh, set of projectile points in our education collection that were very little was known about them. They were collected by an individual probably in the 60s through the 70s and, uh, and donated uh, by his son-in-law. Um, and they were all mostly from Carbon and Emory County and had everything from Paleo Indian points to, uh, to basically post Fremont points, um, as well as some other tool types as well. And she actually went through and used David Hurst Thomas uh, Monitor Valley uh, Gate Cliff Shelter uh, um, projectile point identification, which I used for her because it's based, it's, it's not necessarily always the best for this area, but, it, but it's a lot of overlap and it has a lot of metric. Uh, data that you can actually just sit and measure. And she did this and spent quite a bit of time uh, going through this collection of th 318 points um, and making some suppositions about what it means in terms of changes in population over time. And this uh, actually ended up winning a, uh, an award at the national level. She was invited to state and then invited to the National Science Fair. And she actually has scholarship money because of this and is now planning on uh, majoring in anthropology when she goes to college next year. So that's the goal of this stuff, to get her hooked as a 15-year-old, she's probably 16 maybe, uh, at, into this and say, wow, this is really interesting. Um, and how can I work with local museums, work with local archaeologists? Every Almost every community in Utah has uh, CRM company or uh, federal or state archaeologists in them, and how can we uh, how can we leverage that with our local schools in order to encourage these people, maybe not to become archaeologists or anthropologists, but uh, more importantly to uh, to uh, to respect the archaeological record. Right, I'm in the middle of a site first national site stewardship conference or workshop right now, and you know one thing that it reminds me of these are non renewable resources. Right, the people aren't living like the Fremont or they aren't. Clovis uh, mammoth hunters anymore. So we have to make sure that when we do encounter these sites, we treat them with the respect uh, they deserve in order to both respect those people, but also to get the best uh, scientific understanding of past life ways we can. And just a couple last little slides here, uh, probably overrun my time, I'm sure. This is actually Jody's uh, composite photo. And this is a low resolution one. I think he said the, uh, the high resolution one was two gigs. Uh, but this is a orthographic photo showing it at its final uh, excavation. And it wasn't fully excavated. This wall is part of the remodel. There's actually a clay lined hearth you can see right there. It goes under that wall. Um, and then there's actually some pits and some other stuff too. You can see there's a matate still left. Uh, really big, massive uh, slab uh, slabs here as part of the architecture. And that seems to be common on this and several other sites in Nine Mile Canyon. So what I wanted to do just briefly is um, this is actually for PBS Utah. This is Utah. They did something about Nine Mile Canyon with the Project Discovery Day, and we're not going to watch the whole thing, although it is great because you see these uh, these students, these are Carbon High students, getting a chance to um, to uh, interpret these sites to the visitors, and that's the goal of the Project Discovery Nine Mile Canyon Site Stewardship Day. Traditionally, is to have uh, professional archaeologists there backing up high school or other students um, as they interact with the public and, and explain what they're seeing and why it's important. And we're just gonna watch the very end because they did come up and visit our site here. So. Oh, can you hear it? No, there's no audio on it. Does okay, give me one sec on that. I should be able to, where is it now? Sorry guys, let's see, share computer sound. There we go, okay. Also very sad how he's, he's ruined. Some of the things in this canyon that have really kind of written the prehistory books of this area. 
are, are pretty incredible. It's not discoveries like a, a golden idol or our, our sarcophagus. We don't find things like that in this area. But we find complexes. We find villages where people lived in, 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 in houses and give us real insight into the past when those are found. Maybe what we have here, that, see that little half of a circle? That's a clay-lined hearth. That would have been their fireplace and their kitchen. That's where they would have done a lot of cooking. Well, we can only see part of it because they built this other okay. wall on top. Right? And basically, it's just finding little nuanced things that have a few signs that tell me that it looks like a human uh, was working it or used it. At this site, they've been also finding these little beads that are black, and they're very small and round. Um, and the pottery here is also gray, just a plain gray ware. It's the richness of the lives of the people who live here that is the that, that strikes me with awe every time I come down into this area. These are things that are as old as any of the masterpieces of art of Europe and uh, in the great galleries of the world. And it's something that many of us care deeply about and, and care to protect. Funding for... Right, and, uh, you know, I think Kevin summed that up pretty well, right? We're lucky to live in an area that has such great preservation of both the rock art as well as perishables from all of the uh, overhangs and caves in our state. Uh, but, but it's something that, that is an, uh, a non-renewable resource. And so it does take uh, us engaging with non-archaeologists, with the younger public, and getting them to care about this. Now, as I said, the excavation out there is done, but the project is not. And so if you are interested in following up more on this project, you can either reach out through their website here or through their Facebook group. Um, and of course, everything's a little bit odd in 2020, as you might expect. We're not doing our stewardship day out there and a bunch of other things. But uh, expect if you do follow either of those pages, probably expect some announcements into early 2021 in terms of uh, in terms of the next steps. And we're still doing the lab work. We're still looking for high schools and other student groups. It's really meant to fo be focused on youth groups. That's really the what the BLM wanted out of this was it to be not just community volunteers, although that's part of it, but youth groups in particular. So if you know of a youth group, it could be a Boy Scout troop, it could be a church group, it could be almost any sort of youth oriented group that would be interested in participating. Uh, it would probably be lab work at this point. We'd love to have you contact me or Jody uh, or reach out through the Facebook page, and we would uh, love to try and set something up probably sometime in 2021. And of course, as I said, I was one small part of this, uh, and there were lots of other collaborators uh, as well. And I wanted, you know, I mentioned them all in the beginning, but, you know, I uh, wanted to thank all them as well. Oh, great. We even have a participant in the Zoom chat. I love that. So. Yeah, thanks so much, Tim. I was actually wondering, Crystal, if you're still on, do you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about the time you got to work out there and maybe what you found? Um, sure. So I was on the first, the ver for, very first volunteer weekend out there. Um, it was actually mostly adults that weekend, um, which Jody thought was great because it's like this is the this is the test run see how it goes with a bunch of mostly adults and a few teenagers. Um, it was awesome. It was, we were the ones that broke the ground. Um, there, we found some things just below surface, um, like some beads and some lithics. Um, it was cool seeing the younger kids that were out there. There were, I think four teenagers that were out there with us. Um, and then the rest of us were all adults and seeing the um, teenagers get kind of geeked about it was kind of fun. Um, and it was just, it was a great weekend. It was awesome. That's fantastic. Yeah, Tim, I know I was out there and even though students weren't always finding things left and right, because that's not really how archaeology happens. Um, people were always still having fun, you know? Right. I think it was a pretty positive experience. Uh, there was 
I think one group that sort of had, got lost on the way there and it was a very cold and rainy weekend and they might not have had as much fun, but overall it was a positive experience for almost everybody who did it. Um, and, uh, you know, right now everybody's going to find the same things out of it. But yeah, I, I really think that's, that's uh, about it. And, I, uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but the reason I got interested in archaeology, I was a history and geology double major. Uh, and then I happened to take a field. I took a class called Ancient Celtic Societies with Michael Thietler. And so that's kind of interesting. Well, I can get class credits this summer. I went and did a field school in Mexico and said I get to dig in the dirt and be outside, something I loved. Uh, and also think about the people who used to live in this landscape with sort of awe and wonderment and, and learn about them. It re really was the best combination for me of history and sort of geophysical sciences um, and, you know, a, and really a scientific approach to understanding uh, past human diversity. So that's, that's one of the reasons I became an archaeologist. I think you've hit on something really important there. And with your example of the Carbon High student who went on to get um, science fair awards at the national level, that's how we hook people, right? Is like, hey, this is fun. You're camping for a weekend. But did you know that you could be doing so much more? And then you, you get them. <laughs> and you you spark that lifelong enjoyment of archaeology in young students. And those are the ones that we need to be, obviously, our next generation and asking the next set of important questions. So what I want to know from you, Tim, is how can we get that next generation going? Where can we find them and how can we offer them opportunities that they want to take and that they can then run with? Right. And that's a good question. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's similar, I think, to finding site stewards um, uh, or any sort of uh, public engagement. Uh, I know so Jada Lindbaum was one of the um, she was a graduate student at ASU at the time and was one of the sort of coordinator, volunteer coordinators. Um, and it was hard to get school participation. It was hard to call a school or contact a teacher be like, hey, I want you to round up you know, 10 students and come spend a weekend out in the desert with me and them. They're going to miss Friday at school. And so I do think it, it, it is uh, trying to, you know, particularly when we teach towards core standards and, and standardized testing, um, you know, if you can't make it fit in with what that teacher needs, um, then I think that's that's the, the, the rub there. Um, and so, for example, the Carbon High students, they basically made their students write an essay. And those who wrote the best essays got to go. And so it made it a little more competitive. I also think it starts with uh, uh, smaller presence, not saying, hey, commit for three days. We're going to come in and talk to you in the classroom. We're going to be at county fairs. We're going to be at other places where you can engage kids. Uh, you know, museums are obviously a good one, but getting from that family day at the museum or whatever it might be. And I know you guys have something similar during uh, Archaeology and Historic Preservation Month up at uh, the Rio Grande. Um, you know, getting them to go from that, ooh, I made a split twig figurine out of uh, pipe cleaners to uh, to wanting to engage and volunteer or, or whatever, it really is a challenge. Uh, I don't have good answers. I mean, we do see successful programs like this, uh, like Crow Canyon in Colorado, right? Where, where Macy schools will even pay to go and engage with this, or uh, Shumla, which is a rock art focused research center down in Texas uh, that works both of their local high schools and other, other volunteer groups throughout. So, I mean, there are models to follow, but it is about having it be uh, part of projects from the get-go. It can't be a tack on, add on to the end. Oh yeah, and we're also gonna engage students and also really making it um, something both exciting and accessible, right? I think that one thing we see is that the idea of being an archeologist might not always seem like an accessible uh, career goal for many people, right? Uh, and particularly if you don't know any archeologists in your community, that's one thing we see is that the, the role models that you have in your community really make a big uh, difference in terms of uh, in terms of what you think you could do. Um, and I think also, you know, but I do think uh, effectively talking about, uh, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics, archaeology is a growing field. There's all these jobs in archaeology associated with development. Development's not going to stop. Uh, I do think sort of assuaging those fears of, of both them and their parents is, is a big part of getting them to participate more and more. Um, um, you know, but I don't, I don't have a good answer, but I think it, it's a lot of little answers and really just uh, keeping at it, you know. Um, for example, we're not doing anything with Carbon High really this year directly um, because it doesn't necessarily always fit with what, they, what teachers need. Um, 
Oh, and uh, Chris brought up big brothers, big sisters, right? Or the, um, yeah, uh -huh. that's a good one. Uh, and maybe even, maybe if we had more direct mentorship. Now, of course, you know, we're always asking, we're always being asked for more of our time uh, outside of our jobs as professional archaeologists to do other archaeological stuff. And most of us do it because the reason we're archaeologists is because we're passionate about the, the record um, and, and the subject. Uh, but, you know, there's only so much you can put on people volunteering. And that's why I think it's great that there's now a public archaeologist position at SHPO, as well as a will be a state, state statewide state, state stewardship position there as well, because those are the ways um, you engage them. You know, if you go out to, just for an example, Buckhorn Watch uh, pictograph panel any Saturday uh, for six months, you will probably see hundreds of people stopping there to visit it, right? Um, so how do you get that wonderment and uh, sort of excitement of, of the canyons and take that back into a classroom. And maybe it's through uh, sort of object-based learning uh, and developing lessons, things like project archeology, span which has a curriculum in place for teachers to adopt. Uh, and, you know, but really it's about speaking in your community and taking any public event, public engagement event you can and, and trying to do them. And obviously we can't do all of them. And that's one thing we've been, as a museum, frankly, we've been a little bit lax on. We know we haven't been participating in our, uh, you know, county fairs or parades or various things like that. But just having that uh, sort of public display, a reminder, hey, there is archaeology here. It's staggering to me when I moved here and I met people uh, who, including some of the people who worked in the gift shop at the museum, who'd never been to Nine Mile Canyon, who'd never been to Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. These are, you know, nationally renowned areas for rock art enthusiasts or for dinosaur enthusiasts on the other hand and yet you know it's 30 miles from your house um you know how do we get people to take advantage of those things and that's true almost anywhere in utah there's a really cool archaeological area within an hour of of where you live almost certainly so yeah thank you that's a really an important thing and um you know we do have the ability to visit these things so how do we get people engaged? How do we get them out of their houses? And how do we get them doing it in such a way that, um, you know, they're really taking something home with them in their minds, not obviously physically. <laughs> <laughs> One of the groups that I know that um, we are trying to reach out to really explicitly is the Indigenous community. And Kirk asks, what is your experience getting more Indigenous and diverse youth involved in archaeology? Um, and do you have any any tips for the rest of us when we're thinking about how to get um, how to get people of color in particular um, and people who are not of the typical socioeconomic background of other archaeologists? How do we get them involved in archaeology? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so one of the schools, the first year was uh, Nebo Hills, which is a Title VI uh, school, um, and so that was an Indigenous youth group that came out. They were the only uh, explicitly indigenous group that was out there, uh, although there were some indigenous uh, kids in some of the other schools. Um, and and uh, they were actually the group that uh, got lost on the way out there and had a very cold, miserable time. Um, and so unfortunately, I was not out there that weekend, but it apparently was not uh, not great. Um, but yeah, no, that is a huge problem and a reckoning we're dealing with in archaeology everywhere, whether it's uh, reaching out for tribal consultation uh, in state uh, in state NAGPRA law, right, through things like the Native, in Utah, the Native Americans Re Remains Review Committee, or whether it's just reaching out in tribal consultation for uh, for CRM projects, it is something that's been neglected. Um, and I mean, so the methods uh, really, I mean, is, is again, having role models they can emulate. And we're seeing, there are more indigenous archeologists right now than ever before. Um, I mean, I suppose you could argue when Nelson Nelson was using uh, DNA uh, laborers uh, but that's but in terms of actual the actual PIs and the people d directing the research, there's been, there has been a shift. It's just not a big one. Um, and so, I mean, I think the first part of it is is providing those opportunities close to where they live, right? And also doing it in a culturally sensitive way. Uh, for example, uh, USU Eastern used to have a campus in Blanding. It's now a separate USU campus still, which has uh, about sixty seven percent of their students are are indigenous, um, I shouldn't say kids, but indigenous students. Um, and when I first got here, uh, the town of Blanding, which uh, had effectively an entire Anglo um, leadership structure, uh, 
wanted our museum to come down and uh, start something like a field program down there. Um, and and I, in talking to them, I said, well, yes, we'd be interested in doing something. Uh, you know, and we'd be interested in involving the USU Eastern Blanding students, as well as maybe the high school students down there. But we have to recognize that there's gonna be uh, cultural sensitivities that, we're, that we might not be able to avoid, right? And so, it, uh, you know, and they're gonna be different, whether these kids are, are coming from the Ute communities or from Navajo communities or Hopi communities, which are sort of the three main, uh, and some Paiute groups down there, but those are, those are sort of the three main student uh, indigenous uh, tribes that are represented in that student body. And you know, you've gotta be sensitive to that. And it might mean that we have to, uh, you know, we have to be uh, willing to, um, have elders come and give a blessing. It might mean that we have to do things that are gonna make them more comfortable to have their youth participate in archeology span and not view it as other people trying to tell their history for them, right? Um, and that's one thing we do need to see is, is greater indigenous involvement. Um, it, it, it's happening. It's maybe not happening enough, uh, but it's it's slowly happening. Um, and I think I think it's a good thing. And we're seeing it, you know, with, with things like the, you know, uh, engagement of, MHMU has a has a uh, tribal uh, advisory board. Uh, I might have the name of that wrong. That that they meet with multiple times a year to talk about the museum and uh, you know and not just the representations of tribes in that museum, but but the museum in general and how it can uh, benefit and reflect. And I think the other thing that's uh, important that I've seen History Colorado do really well, as well as some other people, is to talk about uh, traditional knowledge as science or as knowledge to talk about the construction of a hogan from an engineering or geometric shape uh depending on the age of the students uh a geometric shape pattern right uh, it, it talk about beading as being basically uh, a math uh, mathematical pattern um and talking about them and elevating traditional knowledge uh alongside um alongside sort of more western ways of of knowing the world um and so i think that that's that's Part of it. It's having and really just making sure there's a seat at the table. We don't always have to agree, right? Um, you know, we don't have to necessarily agree that they that the youth explicitly explicitly have been here for thirteen thousand years. Uh, you know, based on what the archaeological record says and what their oral traditions say, but we should at least let them give voice to those traditions, right? And give voice to their perspective on it. So. Yeah, thank you. That's a really fabulous answer. And I actually, personal story, have worked with. Um, really uh, like conservative Christian people who are archeologists who do believe that the earth is 6,000 years old. It's that young earth theory. Plenty good archeologists, they can shovel dirt just like I can, <laughs> but you know, there's just, there's, there's beliefs that are different and that is okay. There's, like you said, there's room for everyone. Right, and you know, as you said, sort of the socioeconomic thing is is an issue as well. Uh, there are not very many uh, uh, either African American or Hispanic uh, uh, archaeologists. There are some, um, you know, uh, and that's a, another thing too. And not just socioeconomic, but ethnic uh, identity and and. And it's about having role models. Um, you know, it's about taking, uh, you know, really promoting some of the, uh, well, I think it's called, what's it called? The Black Trowel Initiative, something like that. Uh, that basically is does these little micro uh, grants and micro, um, micro grants for uh, mostly African-American and other uh, people of color uh, students uh, to help them be able to afford $200 textbooks, uh, you know, for one class and that type of thing. And that's not just archaeology, obviously, but in general, uh, equitable access to education and really having archaeology available uh, in community colleges as well, which it sort of moved away from, I think, compared to where it was in the 90s, where there were really strong associates programs in archaeology preparing you to be, uh, you know, uh, working on a field crew uh, in a CRM context. And I know there's still some of them, uh, but I, I think it's sort of you know, move beyond that, um, unfortunately, so. Yeah, I put in the chat um, a link to the Black Black Trowel Collective. It is a really recent group um, that, like Tim described, gives micro grants to people who qualify. Um, I think they gave away about $12,000 in the last quarter. Um, so they're always looking for people who can help to fund. Um, and then they're looking for people who can um, who can qualify for these. And so they're micro grants, you know, they're just a few hundred bucks to, you know, get you through the next semester um, to help you pay for field school. Um, Kirk in the chat mentioned 
that field schools are very expensive and they're often off limits for low income college students. Uh, and field schools, I mean, whether you've taken a field school or not, doesn't always, it's not always an indicator of whether or not you are a competent field archeologist, right? Some people take to this like a duck to water and some people, you know, like myself, went to multiple field schools. And still, when I went on my first field project, I was like, what does lithics mean? <laughs> you know? So it's a, there's a, there's a whole range and there's a whole gamut, but we do have this barrier to access that is a field school. And so getting students in early, um, teaching them how they can navigate the field school world, some are better than others, some are more expensive than others. And then having things like the Black Trowel Collective, and Kirk has also linked us to the Society of Black Archaeologists, that is another fantastic organization. Um, they help just bring scholarship to the masses, um, Black scholarship in particular. Um, it's, they're right. very fantastic organizations. Right, and as you say, the SAA, the sort of national organization, has both uh, Indigenous students um, scholarship, and they also have uh, a tribal consultation. Um, advisory board type thing but I, you know and, and that's a good point with uh, from kirk that field schools are very expensive um and i think there are ways around that uh depending on the state you're in and depending on volunteer opportunities available to you uh, i haven't seen tons of available field work volunteer opportunities in utah but i know there are some um and i think that's now you don't get college credit for it and you might not it might not be as directed as um you're going to learn everything from how to run a theodolite and a total station through whatever, a lithic analysis or ceramic analysis, but it at least gets you your boots dirty and uh, your face dirty probably too. Um, and that's a good start, right? And so I think if you are somebody who's coming from a, a situation where archaeology seems like an untenable career path, that really just reaching out and trying to find volunteer opportunities, even just reaching out to UPAC or USAS, the Utah Professional Archaeological Council or the Utah Statewide Archaeological Society, um, even if they're not actively doing uh, volunteer projects themselves, they can probably direct you to somebody who you could at least maybe come in the lab and wash uh, wash their artifacts for them, right? Uh, and, and get familiar handling them, so. Now you just listed off a whole bunch of organizations and I'm gonna try to link to them in the chat. Um, but. What I would like from you, Jim, is, is are you someone who could be a mentor? Um, just to put you on the spot a little bit, I know that you've worked with a lot of Carbon County students. Um, is that something that, you know, a lot of what you've talked about does require a mentor, whether or not knowing what a field school is can do for you? How, how to even just brand yourself on a resume, like, okay, I didn't go to a field school, but I do have the qualifications that sort of thing you need a mentor for. Absolutely. And it, so we do have a volunteer program here at the museum, uh, as well as uh, other museums do as well. Uh, we, you know, we basically sit you down and we chat with you and find out what your interests are. And we have some sort of minimum commitment of time, um, you know, if we're going to train you up in, in something. And so there's always opportunities here if you're in the price area or willing to travel the price area to get involved in both the lab and sort of the museum side of behind, you know, collections management, but also field work as well. Uh, I've, I've used, you know, I'm, I'm effectively the only archaeologist here. USU Eastern uh, does not have, uh, since Pam Miller retired, another anthropologist. We're, part, we're tied in with the program up in Logan. And I saw Molly Cannon was on here earlier, so good to see her here. Um, but uh, but so effectively, almost all of my field work, it's either me out there, sometimes with a student worker um, that I'm training because there's, they didn't get a field school here, or uh, it's me with volunteers. And in fact, I've had some really great volunteers who've come out of uh, the Range Creek Field School who now live down here and are no longer, are not archaeologists, but are still passionate about it, uh, as well as others. But I'm always willing to whether it's chatting with people, I'm talking with a young man in Michigan right now, who, which is where I'm from, uh, who uh, mom I went to high school with, who's interested in archaeology. I'm always happy to, uh, you know, talk virtually, or if you know, if it's an area I know and I can put you in contact with people uh, who are closer to where you are, I'm always happy to to do that. Yeah, because uh, again, a big part of my job, uh, although my job changed a little bit recently, but a big part of my uh, curator of archaeology uh, part of my job is uh, trying to engage the public, uh, both in the museum and outside the museum. So. 
Yeah. And for my own personal story, it was a random archaeologist at, I think it was UC San Diego that I just cold walked into the office one day and someone happened to be there and mm. they were nice enough to talk to me. Right. Then I was an archaeologist after that. I don't know how that. <laughs> yeah. When do you get to call yourself one? Sure. Yeah. But I, I think you're right. I think it's being approachable and accessible and not, you know, whether it's our ivory tower or whatever, um, if you're encouraging of others and, and like, wow, this, you know, and if you show excitement and, and accessibility to, to this type of stuff, um, you know, it can really, it can really go a long way. I mean, you know, again, there's, there's a fine line uh, between sort of the illicit collecting and other stuff that goes on. There's obviously people who love the archaeological record who, but, but don't want to engage with the, with the professional archaeological community. Uh, well, how do we, you know, turn them to, you know, this is a sad story. I'll go down and talk to schools. Uh, I almost saw every year talk at, uh, at Huntington Elementary to the second grade class. And I have a couple of activities I do, one of which is I bring a box full of pottery shirts. And I say, now everybody take a couple. Okay, now how much left in the box? And there's like six shirts left. Well, this is what happens every time you go to a site with your grandparents and they pick stuff up. If you want this stuff to be here for your grandkids, stuff like that. But it is pretty discouraging sometimes when I say uh, something, you know, and, and somebody and I say, how many, how many of you guys have a parent or a grandparent who has a collection at home? And, you know, half the class raises their hands, depending. Um, and so it's a question of getting these kids not to shame their uh, parents or grandparents, but to help their parents and grandparents realize why that's not the appropriate thing to do to the archaeological record. And, and to recognize that every time we remove it without documenting it, uh, you know, we're, we're losing part of it. Even frankly, when we do document it, sometimes we're, we're losing part of the, of, of the story. Um, nobody's living like a, a Clovis uh, big game hunter anymore. Nobody's grinding Indian rice grass seeds into pancakes like an archaic uh, family anymore. Uh, I mean, maybe we, maybe some of the uh, traditional skills people are, but uh, not really creating sites that way. So if we want to be able to understand these people, we need to to uh, get everybody to buy in, um, most people to buy in uh, on that on that aspect of it. So, and that's a really great segue to Trace's question. Um, they ask, do you and others working in your field have any opportunity or outlet to influence what's taught in schools? Trace mentions that they were not taught anything about indigenous people's history growing up. And they wonder if that's still the case today. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. There's a little bit uh, influence, but it really depends on uh, either you reaching out to the teachers and trying to show how you can fit into what they need to teach their kids already, or uh, the opportunities I have here is effectively in the spring when we see lots of tours come through the museum and explicitly fourth grade and sometimes seventh grade, which do actually have basically an indigenous history component to their uh, core, their social studies core curriculum that year. So th there is some of that. The other thing that uh, you, you can potentially do is reach out to Project Archaeology, um, uh, which Elizabeth just shared, which, ha which has a whole series of really great resources uh, that are tied into common core standards in different states. And, and they do teacher trainings every year, uh, depending on the state. Our state, um, our state um, coordinator, Sam, is down at uh, SUU, um, but she's done trainings here at our museum. In fact, I took, I got two graduate credits in education from USU for 60 bucks uh, for taking it, right? I don't know what I'm ever going to do with those education credits, but, you know, uh, right, you can also take it without getting the credits for no cost, or at least at that one you could. She's done it at Fremont Indian State Park in the past. Uh, she's willing to put on these trainings uh, almost anywhere where there's an interest. But, you know, in some ways, teachers already have enough of their own sort of curriculum and development stuff that they're expected to do. So you've got to make it something that's either going to be like, yes, that's really going to benefit my students, or it's something that, that they're going to be really passionate and excited about sharing. And so just an example, I, uh, let's see if I still have it. I invented a board game. I stole this from an SAA uh, thing. Uh, it's basically a Settlers of Catan type of board game. And you are a band and you have these different food resources that come available at different times and you go through basically all of, from about 13,000 years till present and you have these different technology cards that you draw and you basically have to go through uh, and you have a little book about the edible plants of the Colorado Plateau that I put together um, you know and we got our little 
Uh, it's based on a display here at the museum, some of our herbarium sheets with some of their uses and stuff. And you basically have to go through and keep your uh, group alive by subsisting on the desert and then uh, farming later on in it. Um, and, and all I've developed this, this game and it, and it is built on fourth grade uh, core curriculum standards uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, I actually have not had an opportunity to engage it in the classroom uh, because most of my engagement is more like a family day event where I have 30 seconds to try and grab the attention of a family that might have everybody from a three-year-old to a 15-year-old and engage them. And so those tend to be more tactile, hands-on events. Uh, but I, you know, those are the types of things that Project Archaeology or like my little board game uh, can really do. If you do have a teacher friend uh, and, and they're interested in this at all, um, you know, put them in contact with Elizabeth, put them in contact with a museum archaeologist like us. Not all of us have the time in the archaeological community to do this type of stuff, you know, for uh, if, you know, we're working for a federal agency or a CRM firm or, you know, or a professor at a college, but some of us do. Uh, and, and we're always willing to sort of uh, share, share the load as best we can. So. Hey, Tim, how can we play that game? We've got Jody, Shannon and Joel and Savannah and myself who are all very interested in playing uh, the game. The, the next uh, UPAC or Great Basin meeting, I'll bring it. <laughs> now, um, you know, I thought of, I'm happy to share the resources. The, it's I think it's a Google Doc and I forget what, the, and I think it's, uh, oh, probably, uh, I probably made the map in GIMP or whatever. And I sort of looked at online gaming communities and there are all these online gaming community resources that were well beyond my capabilities. Um, and you know, and, but why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we maybe even make it a digital, uh, a digitally available game down the road? I don't know. I sort of developed it and then it sort of got um, sidebarred. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm happy to share about the resources and or play it with anybody. I've played it with my kids once. But you know how it is. Kids don't want to, you know, play with their parents, you know. Uh, yeah, so. Kids don't know uh, about earthen ovens. <laughs> right. Oh, that's your job. So, yeah. All right. And Chris Merritt brought up the core standards having archaeology and anthropology in them now. Uh -huh. That's, yep. I was going to mention that fourth and seventh grade here in Utah as part of their Utah studies curriculum does explicitly have a section in there for um, indigenous people's histories. We can always do better and we're actually trying to do better. We're um, developing teaching kits. Shannon is mentioning that NHMU outreach educators actually travel to fourth grade classrooms and they right. have their own toolkits. Um, so we have a similar sort of thing. So these resources are in development. Unfortunately, here in Utah, we generally rely on the teachers to reach out for these resources. So we are also trying to work with our um, social studies curriculum, like coordinator here in the state to let them know that these resources are available. Um, we have a large state, a rather rural state for you know, most stretches of it. So we have um, these nodes, these, these areas um, that are like rural education centers where toolkits and teaching kits can be housed. Um, so teachers know to check in with those areas. They can receive some training about how to use those toolkits as well as the kits themselves. Um, so I know that ours has like some physical artifacts and we teach stratigraphy, mm -hmm. um, which also ties into other core curriculum standards about math and science. Right, and, and NHMU does a great job of, of their educational outreach. Uh, really, they're the flagship in the state for that. Uh, and one thing we found, cause, uh, and we have not really been very proactive in this, frankly, as a museum. Uh, part of it is the timing of when you need to reach out to the teachers so that they can plan for it for their upcoming academic year and scheduling. Um, and that's part of it. Uh, and that's one thing, actually, we're going to be a little bit more proactive in the Carbon, Emory, and probably Grand, and maybe San Juan counties. Um, moving forward is sort of reaching out ahead of time, being like, we can have in-class visits with a paleontologist, so on and so forth. But uh, really NHMU does a, about as good a job as they can, uh, but we're a big state and we're a rural state, uh, particularly for those areas like Eastern Utah, where there's 70,000 people across seven counties or whatever it is, um, you know, and so it's sometimes hard to really uh, reach all that, so. That's true. Well, it is one o'clock, so I know that a lot of people do have to jet, um, just really quick before we break and before we let Tim get back to his busy day, wanted to let you guys know that next week we have a presentation on the archaeology of Range Creek, Shannon Boomgarden, Dr. Shannon Boomgarden will be giving that presentation. The bit.ly link is bit.ly slash Range Creek. 
um, range and creek are both capital letters of the first word there. All one word though. Um, it's in the chat. And if you guys just can't get enough of sitting in front of your computer today doing Zoom meetings, we also right now have a site stewardship conference going on. I've taken a, a brief hiatus from that to see that, uh, to see this here. Um, and then the last thing that I want to share with you guys is if you want to get involved in site stewardship, it's appropriate for any age level, kids, adults, families, single folks, whoever wants to be involved, we would love to hear about it um, and hear and get your participation. Tim has mentioned that we do have a site stewardship coordinator. Um, we're hiring for that position right now. And, uh, and so by the time the snow melts next spring, we'll be able to get you guys um, your boots on the ground, helping to preserve and protect the past for you as well. So thank you so much, Tim. Really, really appreciate it. This was a really fun presentation. Um, we will. We will send out an email with some of the, the information we've um, given today because you've given a lot of info, Tim. It's been a lot. I appreciate your optimism that we're going to have uh, any snow this winter to make a difference. So let's hope so. <laughs> I will be optimistic for that. <laughs> but anyway, thanks so much, Tim. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and tune in next week for more Nine Mile Canyon Stewardship Day. Talk to you later. Uh -huh. Okay.